beaten, wounded, destroyed, ruined, occupied, despaired, unbreakable, undefeated. This is how the Ukrainian Bucha looked in the spring of 2022. A year ago, this town in the Kyiv region was liberated, but the pain is still there. The wound is too deep. In memory of the first anniversary of the liberation of Bucha and the victims of the Russian beasts, I, Dmitro Pustovit, will tell you about Bucha before, during and after. Bucha. After. In April of 2022, Bucha was all the international mass media were writing about. The most famous news agencies of the world were reporting about a small town of Bucha near Kyiv. However, the pictures they were showing weren't of a prosperous Ukrainian town. The cover stories depicted dead bodies, a man on a bike, a woman who had just done her nails, and a boy on his mother's grave. When the Ukrainian armed forces finally liberated Bucha, the masks fell, showing the real face of the Russians. Rapes, humiliations, tortures, mass graves. The orcs knew no mercy, neither to old folk or to women or to kids. On April 4th, I went to Bucha myself. I first came to Bucha on April 4th as a fixer of Francesca Manocchi, an Italian journalist. We saw an abyss of sorrow, an abyss of sorrow and suffering. As opposed to other liberated towns and villages that I saw before and after that, residents of Bucha didn't feel that relief or happiness expressed by the residents of the liberated Kherson or Kharkiv regions. One woman told us about repeated rapes. She told us that the Russian soldiers came to her house and said, we'll now live here. She lived with her daughter. They tried to rape her daughter, but that woman said, don't touch my daughter. I will do anything. I'll do anything instead of her. So they became her regular visitors. They raped her as many times as they wanted to and how they wanted to. In one of the first cellars, 18 bodies of massacred men, women and children were found. They all bore traces of physical tortures, broken teeth, cut off ears. Later, the head of the town council claimed there was a mass grave with the bodies of 280 Ukrainians. According to the official data, about 420 of the locals were killed. In reality, the exact number is still unknown. Every single resident of Bucha lost somebody close. One woman, a colleague of mine, was killed. Her body was found in a ravine by the church. I knew people who used to live in the Yablinska street. They are dead. I know other people who had been killed in Bucha. I visited the local cemetery lots of times. Our neighbor's husband died in Bucha. He was killed because he was a military. My neighbor Sasha, who was shot point blank in front of our house. Another neighbor who was in a car with his child. Before the child's very eyes, the father was shot killed at the spot. They were shot. We already knew it. Two boys, Margarita, Oleg Tolkach. They were my neighbors. They were driving in two cars and both got shot. The last story is especially brutal. A family of Chikmarov decided to move out of Bucha with their two sons. They already knew what it was like to leave their home behind. In 2014, they left their native Donetsk region. However, the war caught up with the family closer to Kyiv.
In my life, I made two attempts to save my wife and my kids. I succeeded when I saved my family from Donbass, but I failed to move them out of Bucha. She was so beautiful, very beautiful and clever. And our children were the same, beautiful and clever. On March 5th, we tried to leave Bucha and go to the western Ukraine. We got into the car. No sooner had I parked by the side of the road than the shooting began. We didn't have time to move anywhere. Right after we parked, the shooting started. The car caught fire. I turned back and saw that my kids and my wife were already dead. I realized that I was wounded. I bent down, opened the car, crawled out and started crawling between my car and my neighbor's car. I crawled into the park. I couldn't feel my leg. When I looked at it, I saw that a part of my leg was only hanging by skin and my jeans. The doctor who saved me said, God must still have a plan for you if he kept you in this world. A unit of the Russian Guards, Vitez, the 76th Storm Division from Pskov, and at least three units of the Chechens. They were the people committing crimes and killing civilians under occupation. Later, at the interrogations, the Russians confessed that they had been instructed to shoot at everybody. Natalia Volinska, her husband and their friends got under fire in the same way as Chekmaryov's family. Although, when death was whispering in their ear, life wouldn't let them go. We used to go to Irpin a lot. This is the only road to Irpin. Every single time you remember what happened here. At 7.30 a.m. we got into the car and drove along the Pushkinska street. At that time this house was already ruined and the water tower was ruined too. Here a burned tank stood and there was a white car that a tank had simply ran over. Nothing remained of the driver as the tank simply drove over his car from the driver's side. Here a car was shot. This is the place where we first saw the shot car. We moved forward and saw a tank and four soldiers with automatic guns by this waterbed. They stepped forward and started shooting at us. The bullets hit the windshield, all the wheels the radiator and the doors. We acted fast and turned back. On driving back, we bumped into the shutdown car here. Due to the force of impact, our car fell off the curb. It all happened right here. And here, our car turned over, so we stayed. Once my husband and I went to collect firewood, as we had neither light nor heating, we saw an armored vehicle, and it didn't stop, it kept driving right at us. We ran away from it. These people won't stop. They will continue destroying us. We still feel fear because the war is not over. We can't be sure. Subconsciously, we still worry that they may come back. These streets saw death. The most horrible pictures were dead bodies of the locals lying along the road. 
They were filmed on two streets, the Yablunska and Vokzalna. The famous photo with the column of the destructed Russian vehicles was taken in the latter one. Now the town is liberated and demined, and it's hard to imagine that the Russians had washed these peaceful, bustling streets with the Ukrainian blood. However, the residents of Bucha didn't forget. People living here saw hell with their own eyes. We watched it all unfold. It was in just 50 meters. The massacre started there. The Vokzalna. The Vokzalna. The Vokzalna street. See that house under the green roof? This is where we first heard don't shoot. We don't know who said it, a soldier or that famous old man. We know now that the old man threw the Molotov cocktail and stopped the first fuel truck. This is when the real chaos began. This is all what is left from my house. I made it worth my while. Guys, I did what I could to show them. They were hiding behind buildings. They were sticking their weapons out to shoot. At first we hid in the bathroom. But later, when nothing was left intact in the apartment, when we had neither windows nor doors, we went out and sat under the building's staircase. We drove out as soon as the column arrived. A tank was moving at us. When driving along this road, we saw a soldier with an automatic gun at every turn with a tank behind him. Our departure was quite an adventure. We as a family owe our lives to our neighbor. When the war started, it was too late to go to a fueling station. There was not enough fuel in our car. When the town was already occupied, when the time came to decide whether to leave or to stay, when we realized that it was then or never, he had some fuel in his garage, a barrel. He gave it to all the neighbors who needed it, fueled their cars to the brim and said, we shall go. I've always considered myself lucky. Screw the occupation. Even though three of our houses are damaged, even though our nerves are in taters, despite everything else, I'm happy. Because all my family and all my family members live in Bucha or around it, my entire family is alive. The enemy ruined and damaged 861 private houses, 122 multi-story buildings and 875 industrial enterprises. The total costs of the damages that the Russian military inflicted on the town exceeds 5 billion hryvnias. The occupants did what they wanted. They used the civilians as a living shield. They stationed military vehicles in their yards and threw people out of their homes at the gunpoint. Here my husband is dancing in the Romeo and Juliet. When we were still living, as they say, peacefully, a Russian soldier knocked at our door. He said that we should leave. I asked him, where may we go? We don't know where to go. We didn't even know whether the shelters were as at that point. Everything was unclear. He said, go where you want to. I asked, how much time do we have to pack? I'm not alone here. I have a husband, a child, a dog, a cat. I need to collect things for all of them. And he said, I give you five minutes. When we went out, the tanks were already everywhere. The Russian soldiers were around. We didn't know whether we would reach a safe place or whether one of them would kill us on the way. But we 
lacked our courage and walked past them. This is the house where we stayed. We didn't spend much time there, though we mostly sat in the cellar. It was very cold, but we had to stay there. Here I was doing laundry, by the way. On March 24th, Kadyrov's people arrived. As soon as the first one came in, he said, I am the liberator. That liberator stood there with an automatic gun with other armed people around him. Can you imagine? What could we do? He said, give us your passports, we'll register you. Young people came from Buratia. They were not Russians, they were the Burats this time. They asked my husband, why didn't you go? Why aren't you defending your state? And he answered, I can't because I don't know how. This is not the education I got. I am an artist of the ballet. So the soldier said, prove it. What could he do? He knew he was there and we were there, so he did splits and a couple of turns. The belly turns, see? And some splits. Anything he could do, but the soldier said, show something else. So he showed them the gopak, some moves from the gopak. They said, all right. However, he did it all at gunpoint. I had a feeling that we were crawling out of our holes one by one by rats. We would go out to look around, it's so quiet, no tanks, no nothing, everybody was scared. What if the quiet didn't last? Everybody was looking around, okay, it's quiet now. And then we saw the vehicles of our defenders, of the Ukrainian forces. God, all people were running to them, crying and shouting, glory to the heroes. The apartment is a mess. The main thing is the walls still stand, the house still stands. Water and food were scarce under occupation. The water tower was ruined and the shops were closed. The Russian snipers were hiding in the multi-storied buildings. They shot at people for moving about the town. The residents of Bucha survived thanks to each other. Heroes whose faces you won't see in mass media walk the streets of this town. We kept in contact with our forces. One day our guys called and said, all young people shall immediately leave. I ran to the locals, we shoved as many as we could in all the cars we had. Another queue. This is how our kids left. We planned to leave too, and there was space in the cars, but when everybody came out to line up for evacuation, the residents started telling me, my grandma stays here, my grandpa stays here, I have chicken there, I left a dog, please look after them, please feed them. It was horrible. I stood there and then I said, how? How may I live? The Chikmarevs were killed, Margarita was shot. I just couldn't leave them alone. And this is how we stayed. Then the old grannies came, three of them, all in their 80s. I had a jar of sweet corn and a can of spreads. So we shared a spoonful of corn and two spreads each. This is how we lived. I had an oven outside. It was my husband's dream. Once during vacations he made a barbecue oven with instructions from internet, a proper one with an oven. 
so we cooked food on it. We ate God knows what, but then people started calling me, saying, I left the kids there, go and take food from the fridge. So we used to go there all together, take food, cook food, bring it to those old folk in jars. It was like a conveyor belt. The chicken laid eggs, we shared eggs. I come from Bucha, so many people knew me. They started bringing honey. Here, share between the people, or cereals, or sugar. This is how we survived. People brought what they could. We restored the electricity, the wires were badly connected, but they did the job. I shouted at some people, I confess, I swore at some. I am honest with you, some had to be shaken a bit to come to their senses. Lots of things happened. But if a person turned to me for help, well stood up and went to help. We hid it from the Russians. First we pierced the tires and then pumped them back. We loaded it and went to the neighboring villages to Irpin. It was horrible in Irpin. People there lived without any water. It was a disaster. I cried at every single stop. Beasts. They are fighting kids and old people. I have no idea what one can do to people to make them behave like this. In the Zavatska street, God, I've never seen anything like that. It was sorrow, sheer sorrow. People were scattered along the street, all swollen. Parts of people. One van stood by the train, crossing with the arms at the wheel. There were only arms and shoulders, no head. A roof was damaged in one house. During rains, the roof leaked. We found some building materials and went to repair the roof. And then we saw our soldier. We climbed up and he shouted, Valerievna, and I shouted, Volka. We hurried down from the roof to strangle Volka in our arms. That was the moment of happiness. I have jackets here. They were delivered yesterday. All for the boys. The t-shirts, warm shirts, jackets. What do I have here? Sweaters. I'll send them to the boys in Drushkivka to the stabilization point. Despite all the sufferings that the Russians inflicted on the locals, the Ukrainians have a talent that can't be destroyed with any weapons an ability to believe in the best and to emit light even in the darkness. Alisa is a copy of her father. Not only people who know us say so, but even those who have never seen us before. Alisa was born on March 8th at 7 a.m. The candles stood in all corners. The cat was by the side, too. It all happened right here. I didn't worry. Now I'm surprised at how I behaved at the state I was in. I tried to think positively as I understood if I started to worry and think about bad stuff. It might impact my baby and my birth. I found out that a doctor, a general practitioner, lived in my house. I went to meet her as I didn't know her before. I told her about my situation. She said that she had no choice. I have to help you. I wasn't preparing, but I just knew what to do. When studying at the university, I wanted to become an obstetrician. My colleague wrote me that somebody would soon give birth in the Tarasivska street. I asked for the house number. She said it was 8A. I said, but this is my house. 
My colleague also sent my Linux to some materials so that I could read them to refresh my memory. I didn't have any specialized literature at home as I work in another sphere. She is a great person. Now, when we call or write to each other, she always says, I don't think of myself as of a hero. You are a real hero. I say, no, I'm not a hero. You are. She has three kids herself, all under 18. But she said, I won't go anywhere until you give birth. I didn't plan to leave. I didn't want to, but my husband said, Everybody has given birth, all old grannies are being treated, everybody has pills, a half of the street has left, you're the only one staying, so get into the car and we'll leave. This is what we tied your umbilical cord with. The residents of Bucha heaved a sigh of relief on April 2nd, when the enemy left the Kiev region for good. Then the new old life returned to the town. The same faces, but with different thoughts. The same streets, but with different memories. The same neighbors' houses, but often without their owners. The town experienced the after. We will never forget it. It just won't go away. Everybody who was here and even those who weren't, pain will remain in every heart. My after has come. A part of my life is over, of course. After, our town will prosper. My after is a bit unpleasant. I feel sad because people do forget it all so fast. After is already here for all Ukrainians, because after the full-scale invasion, all our lives changed dramatically. My after will come when the last pants will be sewn. This will be my after. As for us, after we'll make movies about Mariupol, Bakhmut, Luhansk, and all the places where the enemy is now testing our unbreakable spirit. The main thing is, the after will definitely be Ukrainian. We'll win. Glory to Ukraine.